Hey folks, uh, Mr. Howard here. This is the first video lecture I've ever recorded. It's probably going to be um, awkward, but um, yeah, my dogs might start barking or, you know, somebody might come to the door. Who knows? Uh, but I'm downstairs in my kids' uh, school room and uh, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of Ender's Game for those of you that are reading it because I know you've got to read it and you don't have me to interpret anything for you, so I thought I'd give it a shot. Uh, so that's that's the plan for today. I don't know if you can read the board. I've written some stuff up there. Um, you know, maybe you can zoom in. Maybe you can't. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, so, uh, Ender's Game. Ender's Game is a sci-fi book by Orson Scott Card. Um, we're just going to talk about some of the difficult aspects of the story right now and some of the illusions and themes and symbols and, and stuff like that that's going on. So, um, first off, uh, if you crack open chapter one, um, you know, when you start looking through it, you're going to find that every chapter has what we call a, a preface, sort of a chapter preface. Now, a preface um, is like something that happens before the actual chapter happens. Um, and in this case, it's always dialogue. It's always in bold. Um, somebody's talking to somebody else. And um, it's always Colonel Graf. So, if you if you read the story and you get the setting of the story figured out, you'll discover that um, there's this guy named Colonel Graf um, who is um, in charge of this thing called Battle School. And Battle School is an orbital space station in which they train um, children hoping to um, train the next general who's going to defeat uh, the invading enemy fleet, which is these things called the buggers. Um, and you get an introduction to the idea of the buggers and, and astronauts and the, the warfare that's been going on in Chapter 1 when Ender's older brother, Peter, um, you know, wants to play a game. Um, the thing's called Ender's Game, and we'll talk about games shortly. Uh, anyway, Colonel Graf's always talking in the preface to somebody else, and the somebody else changes as, as the book goes on. Um, but they're always talking about Ender. You find out that Graf's been spying on Ender his entire life, um, that Ender is something that's called a third, um, meaning he's a third child. You discover that... Um, the dystopian world in which they live uh, is an overpopulated world in which uh, all the countries of the world have had to unite because of the danger of the buggers, these insectoid aliens that have invaded the planet. And um, in an attempt to defeat the buggers, um, they've sent their best and their brightest up to this battle school. They've created something called the International Fleet. But it's not all harmony down on Earth. All the divisions, um, you know, that... that used to exist on the world still exist on the world even though the united fleet theoretically is uh facing the aliens together uh so you know like when when people talk about politics on earth in the book there's i mean it was written in the 80s so you know there's sort of like a, a western side and then like a soviet side and they they sort of hate each other but they grit their teeth and they work together to keep themselves alive um so anyway back to back to the the idea of the world, um, the overpopulated world, um, apparently there's been a law passed that nobody can have more than two children. So um, for a family to have a third children, a child, that's really, that's really strange. And Ender is a third, which makes him unique uh, from the very outside of the book. And um, his, his third status is an object of ridicule uh, in school. Uh, maybe it's jealousy, maybe it's something else, it's hard to say. Uh, but Anyway, um, yeah, this is my first lecture, so bear with me. Uh, and and normally I, I take cues from all of you. You know, like you ask questions, I get interrupted, I think about it, I come back to where I was. I got no, I got no audience except in the virtual reality land. So um, Ender's third status is an indication that he his family is exceptional. Uh, he had a brother named Peter who ended up being a sociopath. He had no conscience, and he's he's very vicious and angry, um, and um, not a really intelligent, uh, uh, enormously uh, bright guy, but um, not suitable as a leader because of his lack of of empathy and conscience. And then he had a sister, Valentine who um, is all empathy. She, she always feels for everybody, and that makes her a terrible leader because she's unwilling to make the hard decisions. And so Colonel Graf and um, the people up there in, in 
uh, the elite force, uh, decided that they should have a third kid. And hopefully this third kid would be their perfect general. And his name is Andrew, uh, which is shortened to Ender. And it gives you sort of the, the story. So um, that gives you the setting, the dystopian world. That gives you the idea of the beginning of the chapters with Graf talking to somebody about Ender. Um, and then you can go down and, and we'll talk about some of these other things. The narrator of this story, you'll discover, is um, third person. Um, but it's it's limited. The limited point of view is Ender. So you read the story from Ender's perspective, but it's written in the past tense um, with a limited narrator, aside from those those prefaces to the, the chapters. Um, there's two chapters that are written from Valentine's point of view. I think it's chapter 9 and chapter 13. Um, so you want to pay attention to those. Um, yeah, another thing that you probably want to pay attention to as you read, is there going to be these chapters where uh, Ender goes into something called the mind game. It's it's a sort of a virtual reality computer that happens inside Ender's head and that is monitored um, in sort of a creepy way by Graf and the adults on the space station. It's a way for them to sort of test the psychological um, situation in each of their students. Um, and Ender takes a mind game to places that no other student has ever taken the mind game. He does that with everything. Uh, and you get used to that because he's incredibly brilliant. Um, but the mind game ends up being sort of this psychological study of Ender as a person. And literally everything in the mind game ends up being symbolic for something that's happening in his real life. Um, or some way that he's dealing with something. And so when you read those mind game chapters, you want to sort of turn on the allegory analysis. You guys remember allegory from Animal Farm. Uh, you want to turn on the allegory analysis and think about, um, you know, like what this allegorically represents. Um, you know, what's, what are these images in the, in the dream game world and what do they represent in Ender's real life? What are they saying about his, his emotional state and how he's dealing with things? And that will help you understand those chapters, which can be confusing, I think, if you don't, if you don't start putting those pieces together. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is themes. So, uh, you know, there's a number of themes in Ender's Game, and if you're annotating it, if you're going through and you're trying to figure out what's going on, some of these can help you with your thinking. So I'm just going to go over these themes uh, relatively quickly. First theme I've got up here is empathy versus sociopathy. So you need to know what those two words mean. Empathy is when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes and you, you think about the world from their perspective and try and uh, you can put, your, put yourself in their place and, and feel what they're feeling. Um, it's really important to have a society in which people are empathetic because if people aren't empathetic, all they are is selfish and all they go for is, is themselves. A sociopath is the other side. It's a person who doesn't have a conscience, a person who can't uh, put himself in other people's shoes or doesn't want to or doesn't care and um, the only person they ever think about is themselves. And obviously Ender's got a brother and a sister. His brother um, is a sociopath, um, which makes him unfit as a leader because people don't care about him and he doesn't care about them. He really only cares about himself. And as a sociopath, he's, he's really smart and really high functioning. So he can start to understand, you know, how to manipulate people, but it's never heartfelt and it doesn't really work. Um, and then you've got Valentine, who's an empath. She really understands and, and loves and cares for other people. And so she can't do bad things. And sometimes, uh, card the author seems to be arguing a leader has to make difficult choices he has to put people in harm's way he has to he has to do bad things and therefore um she is not an effective leader either and so you've got ender in the middle and to some extent you ever see those those cartoons where there's like an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder and they're both trying to manipulate um the person in the middle into making a decision that's sort of how it is for ender um, Valentine is the angel on one shoulder and Peter is the devil on the other shoulder and he sees himself in the in a very clear spectrum with her on one side and him on the other side and um, he's trying to make the choice and I think Card is saying to us that we are on that spectrum and we have one voice that's selfish and one voice that's empathetic and we're trying to place ourselves on that spectrum of morality. And so a lot of this book is about where you fall, where civilization falls on that spectrum of morality. And you totally want to pay attention to that and those scenes when they happen. It also shows up in the dream um, game, the mind game, and all of those sorts of things. Um, next theme is leadership. Um, you know, a lot of the, the preface quotes at the beginning of the chapters have to deal with, deal with the alienation of leadership. And so... Um, you know, look at look at those. Uh, I think one of Card's major standpoints is that a good leader has to be um, divorced from their soldiers to some extent. They have to have some of those sociopath qualities. Um, 
in order to be an effective leader, they've got to send people into harm's way. They've got to be willing for negative consequences. They've got to take risks. Um, you know, they've got to be alienated. They've got to be separate. And so leadership is alienating. In order to be an effective leader, you cannot um, be too close with the people that you're leading. Uh, and that comes across. It turns out that um, this book, this is kind of a fun, you know, side note, is taught uh, in the United States War College um, you know, in terms of a study of leadership. They, they still read it and teach it today, which I think is fascinating. Um, so obviously the United States military has some, some good ideas that came from Orson Scott Card's book and they use it in their classes. Anyway, um, so we'll, we'll look at leadership and you can think about what makes a good leader as the story goes on and what Card is trying to tell you about that. Um, Next uh, is a very timely one from when the book was written. The book came out in the 80s, and one of the central themes is individuality, um, the ability to think and to come up with your own solutions on an individual basis versus uh, community. And you see this all throughout the book. Like when he's in battle school, um, you know, they use these things called formations, and Ender's the first one to break the formation tactics and um, to trust the indivi individuality of his individual soldiers and to, you know, do some of these kinds of things. And that represents sort of like the American style, whereas the buggers, the ultimate enemy, are the, the incredible communism. They're a hive mind. They don't think alike. They all do what they're told all the time. And so on some level, this is a story about humanity, individuality, versus the buggers, communism, and uh, how individuality actually fosters um, the winning side. And so there's a little bit of an overlap with Animal Farm. You can see some of the same, same ideals there, uh, but it's definitely sort of a timely piece from the 80s, and you can find that theme underlying a lot of stuff, and that opens up a window to you. Um, that's another aspect of leadership is trust. You've got to trust the people that you're leading. Um, if you don't trust them, if you have to make all of the decisions all of the time, um, they're going to fail because they're going to need you to make the decision for them. And so you'll see that um, come out as well. Um, next, we have a couple of, well, one of the good old standbys that we've seen in so many books. is a book about a child who's growing up. And as a book about a child who is growing up, it's going to be about loss of innocence and the sadness of loss of innocence. Ender um, is not as innocent as Valentine. Uh, but far more innocent than Peter, and in order to be successful at his mission, he's going to have to willingly give up his innocence um, over a series of decisions, and you're going to see that continue to grow as the story grows, as he matures faster than he should, and his childhood is lost. And it's sort of sad, um, you know, but it's something that, that Card's talking about as well. Finally, you know, it's called Ender's Game, and the whole thing is full of games. There's a mind game. There's Peter wanting to play buggers and astronauts. There's a series of challenges at Battle School, which are the games. There's Command School, which has a series of games. And the whole thing is a game. But games are a complicated idea in here. Um, you know, in a game, you don't have to have morality. You do what you want to do because everything's a game. Well, to Peter, who's a sociopath, literally everything is a game. He's playing to win. And so he doesn't consider other people and other people's lives as important because when you don't have a conscience, it's all a game. You know, and then you got Valentine who's on the other side of that perspective. So it all connects together. And, and you know, Orson Scott Card is asking, is life a game? Is there more to life than, you know, moving pieces and winning and getting the most for yourself? Uh, and, you know, that's a question that he wants his readers to consider again. I'm not going to tell you an answer to that, but I think it's something that you should you should think about. Um, all right, I've got to erase the board, and let's talk a little bit about illusions. Um, there's an underlying set of illusions in Ender's Game. Um, maybe I won't erase the board. Maybe I'll just, just talk about it. Um, First off, you're going to get to this weird chapter, uh, chapter 9, that's called Demosthenes and Locke. Um, these are two um, famous people, and, uh, you know, Valentine and Peter are going to get online and use fake identities. Uh, Valentine is going to take on Demosthenes' name, and uh, Peter's going to take on Locke's name, and they're going to impact the world through... Um, you know, this was written in the 80s, so it's chat rooms, but the reality is that it's very much like meme culture and social media and all of those things, and, and Card was really pretty good in predicting uh, what was going to happen um, in the world. So anyway, um, Valentine takes on this name, um, Demosthenes, and that's a Athenian Greek um, politician. He was essentially a 